Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And today we're going to study one of those lessons near the end in the, as it's discussed in the book of Luke. And this series, is, uh, entire series has been on the book of Luke. This is lesson number 12 in that series for June 20 of 2015. It's entitled, Jesus in Jerusalem, and we're going to ask ourselves some questions about how much time did Jesus spend in Jerusalem, what did he do when he was in Jerusalem, who did he face, what kind of problems were there, and so forth. And so it's going to be an interesting lesson, I'm sure. Hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to look at several verses. Of course, our, our main focus is the book of Luke, but we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, we Thank you once again for these inspired records. We look forward to the day when we can actually speak and talk to the people who wrote the books and understand something of the reasons why they wrote what they wrote and of course, maybe most important of all, know all the other stories that we don't have recorded. We ask now that you will guide us in our discussion of this material that we may represent your right as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you read the Old Testament, and even much of the New Testament, you get the impression that Jesus came to this earth primarily for one reason, and that's to see Jerusalem. Not just to see it, but to impact it, to somehow reach the people in Jerusalem. How well did he do at that? Not too well, huh? It was Are you the that Jesus failed. Well, there are some reasons to ask some real questions about that. Um, it's hard, hard for us to think that he, he failed, but he didn't accomplish everything he wished he could have. I mean, obviously, what he would, he would have liked to have saved everybody living on planet Earth, wouldn't he? And he hasn't succeeded in doing that. Okay. He, would, he would like to have saved the whole Jewish nation. He didn't succeed in doing that. So not everything he set about to do, he accomplished. And he certainly didn't save the, all the scribes and Pharisees. John, yes, Jim. John 17, verse 4, yeah. says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. Yeah. So what I was that? I glorified thee on the earth, uh -huh. having accomplished the work you gave me to do. That's the RSV translation. Yeah. So apparently that it was sufficient. And he didn't make another st stab at it. He, you know, it's uh, what, what I've begun to think recently. God uses words. Mm -hmm. to communicate to us, and we have a lot of words here. He's kept himself kind of out of the, in the shadows, so to speak. He doesn't stand over us and intimidate us and threaten us. He uses words to try to persuade us the truth about himself and how, how to live. So that's one, one way of yeah. looking at things. Well, Jerusalem was established as the headquarters of the Jewish nation, or the Hebrew nation, about almost exactly a thousand years before Jesus came. And that was established the point, at the point where David and his military group uh, conquered the Jebusites and moved into the city. Not too long after that, the great temple of Solomon was built. That temple was destroyed after about, uh, what would you say, I guess it's 450 years, no, 420 years, 10 years, something like that later. Um, and um, then, of course, there, were, there was a time when they were all in and captivity in, in Babylon, and then a, another temple was built, which came to be known as Herod's Temple, after uh, he refurbished it to a considerable extent, and, and it was there that Jesus spent almost all his time when he was actually in Jerusalem. Now, you would have thought if he was opposed so much by the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he would have avoided the, the temple because, I mean, wasn't that the place where that was their headquarters? So why did he spend so much time in, at the temple? So many people coming through all the time. That's where the people were. And why was it safe for Jesus to be there? The more people, the more likely he wouldn't be seen. Well, it's not a question of not being seen. They knew perfectly well where he was. But there were hundreds and hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people standing around, hanging on every word. They didn't dare to go and arrest him in front of all those people. Too many witnesses. Too many witnesses and, and people who would have very much opposed what they were trying to do. Lots of, lots of teaching opportunities as yes, well. Yes, very much so. 
would be too many cell phone videos. Yeah, well, maybe not. <laughs> but when you think about it, in answer to your earlier question, we'll never know till we get to heaven how yeah. many people he really touched. Yeah, yeah. But in actual fact, we know that m almost all of his life was spent in Galilee. Only a small percentage of the time was actually spent in Judea, and an even smaller amount of time in Jerusalem itself. We know that he, he went there for his circumcision on the eighth day. He went there again for his dedication, apparently about the, about the 40th day. Then his family had to escape to Egypt. And then, it came, of course, he came back at the age of 12. We know about that story from Luke 2. And then there was a, the longest period of time he spent in Judea and on Jerusalem was between the time of the baptism and the time when he finally departed because they were trying to catch him and arrest him. He finally left Judea and went to Galilee. That was a period of about a year and a half where he spent most of his time, not all of his time, but most of his time in Judea. How much do we know about that period of time? Almost nothing. nothing. Almost nothing. Part of the book of John. A few comments, in the, a very few comments in the book of John. One of the one of the probably the only major thing we know about that time that period of time was when he cleansed the temple the first time and wasn't that also when Nicodemus approached him yes yes exactly and the woman taken in adultery no that that that, that came later. later that came yeah. later yes well a careful look at the gospels reels that almost half of each of the gospels is dedicated to the final week of the life of Jesus now, obviously, what does that tell us? Very important. It's important, yeah. Very important. And, and they, the gospel writer said you have to get to know the details of that final week. Ellen White put it in these words, Desire of Ages, page 83, paragraph 4, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day and contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. And that's what we're going to try to do today. Jesus says God wept over the city of Jerusalem, down to much of the history of the Old Testament, not just in the New Testament. Finally, he appeared as a human being and wept over the city once again. It was there where he had should have been recognized as the king of the Jews, but he was murdered by the very ones he had come to save. And the question we asked earlier, how could, how could God, I mean, Jesus is the best teacher the world has ever known, the most successful, the most persuasive. How could he have apparently failed to have the kind of impact he wanted to have on the Jewish nation? What was going on there? It's called freedom to reject him. Yeah. And who else was working there at the time? Well, you can be sure the devil was right. <laughs> the devil and every one of his angels must have been focused on, on defeating Christ's work. And they were, they were busy. Well, Paul said some interesting things about that. Look at Romans 5, verse 10. We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? So, I guess our overall question is going to be, how is it that that final week, especially the death of Jesus, makes us into his friends? Now you know that the standard explanation is that he performed some kind of a legal transaction and he paid the price for sin. And does that, does that make us into God's friends? Does that really sort of impact you in the, you know, where, where it really counts? Well, I would like to suggest a little different approach that was suggested way back in the Garden of Eden. God had said in Genesis 2.17, except the tree, must, you can eat of all the other trees, except for the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. That was God's warning. And what, what does that basically mean? What it says. 
Does it have any implication? <coughs> any, I mean, you don't have the option of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I don't either. Uh, does that impact us in any way? Well, I think maybe not the literal tree of knowledge of good and evil, but I have my own tree. <laughs> <laughs> I we, all, we all have our own tree. I see. <laughs> So, are you suggesting that God is giving some kind of a blanket statement that sin leads to death? Would we dare to say that? Yep. Well, blanket. All, all of us sinners are a little uh, hesitant to say that very loud, right? I think more of a pointed statement rather than a blanket statement. It doesn't explain how the physics are involved or uh, who's right. involved. It just says, you do this, you will die. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a threat. It was more in the nature of a warning. But no explain. We don't have any explanation until you keep keep on reading. Yeah, well, you know that in Genesis three verse four, the snake replied, and after asking Eve if that was really true, he said, "That's not true. You will not die." God said that because He knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. And that first statement is the basis for most religions' belief in a doctrine of hell. Mm -hmm. Well, and they believe that lie. Yeah, most churches believe that lie. Yeah, yeah, and most yeah, and most so really biblical the scholars. Is who can be trusted? <laughs> who who's telling us the truth? Presumably, sooner or later, if we if we discover the truth, then the one who can be trusted is the one who's telling us the truth. Right? Is that a fair statement? I, think I hope it's so. Kind of interesting. I think Ellen White says that <coughs> the devil said, "See, I've eaten a, I've eaten the apple. I'm yeah. still alive." Yeah. Yeah, <coughs> exactly. If you ask most Christians, can God be trusted to say, of course. Mm -hmm. Then you go into the implications of that and, well, they're not so sure. Mm -hmm. Well, if we really believe that sin leads to death, does that, would that impact us in any way in our behavior? What, what, is, what is the magical ingredient there that causes life to convert to death. What, what, well, the what, Bible what actually, happens there? I mean, it, doesn't, it appears that it didn't happen to Satan. No, but I, and there's a reason for that, which I don't want to go into in a great deal right now. But if you look at Isaiah 59, verse 2, now that's quite a ways further down in the Bible, but it's on the screen there. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship Him. And there's lots of other verses, especially in Acts 17, 25 and 28 and some other places that say that God is the only source of life. So if we're separated from life, what happens? Well, not self-existence, so you're going to no, die. You're going to die. So that, that's a sort of very, very simple explanation of how that all works. That's, that's quite interesting. It says your sins prevent you from, from communicating with God when you're trying to worship. That's, you would think when you're trying to worship that um, you would have, you would be able to communicate, but evidently it's possible to to make an effort to try and worship and not be able to do that. So in Isaiah's day, why would, why would he have said you know, it's your sins that separate you when you try to worship God. Why would you have said that? Your priorities, and obviously sin really begins in the mind. Mm -hmm. you, you want something that either doesn't belong to you or you're... Have, Were they uh, worshiping other idols too? Probably. <laughs> In Isaiah's day, they were heading for the hills worshiping the fertility cult gods, and then they would come on, presumably on Sabbath, come into the temple and pretend to worship God. Well, how, do you, how, would God, how should God respond to that? Like, like he didn't know what was going on? God is not mocked. <laughs> God is not mocked. That's exactly right. Well, the incredible thing is how Jesus managed to teach his disciples Maybe I should say even what he didn't manage to teach his disciples. Um, despite the fact that Jesus had made it clear that he was going to up to Jerusalem to be arrested and killed, he said that at least three times that we have recorded in Scripture very clearly. And it's, and it's, it's, it's 
it's copied in, in more than one of the Gospels. And still, what did they think? As they're climbing up that road from Jericho to Jerusalem, they are absolutely certain that when they get to Jerusalem, they're going to crown him as an earthly king. The disciples were sure of that. The crowd, they were shouting hallelujah. They were sure. And then when they, he had, he, he, on, on Sunday morning, that triumphal entry, oh man, they were just higher than a kite. They were sure. It was all, it was all just in the cards. How is it that the Jews thought that Christ, who had nothing virtually, there yeah. was no wealth, there was no property, there was no nothing, and yet at the same time they believed that if you did good, mm -hmm. you gained everything, mm -hmm. that the, the good person was the person who was wealthy. And what, it seems like a direct contradiction yeah. there. How did that work? Well, I think the only explanation I've ever been able to come up with for that is the fact that they knew he had the power to create whatever he needed. So the, the power of his word was all he needed to his, to, as far as his believers were concerned. Maybe not according, not according to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and the doubters, but as far as, I mean, if you could take a handful of food and, and feed 20,000 people, do you really need gold and silver and, you know, a high position? They didn't think so. Caiaphas knew what was going on. Mm. Was, economically, it scared him. Yeah. Power-wise, ec <laughs> the economy of power and so forth. Yeah. So we, we need to understand clearly that as they climbed up that hill, the disciples were sure that they were about to become the, the members of the ruling junta, whatever you want to call them. The ruling, the ruling group of, of people. They were, gonna, they were gonna take over Jerusalem and and, and be the, the the this cabinet, if you will, of of Jesus. And they were gonna rule the land. And they were gonna chase out chase out the Romans. Well, at the at his birth, uh, who came from a distance to announce that he was the king of the Jews? Magi. Magi. At the opening of the final week of Christ's life, he rode into to Jerusalem to shouts of God the King who comes in the name of the Lord. While the history of that week seemed to be an utter disaster to the disciples, that's what they thought at the time, and the other followers of Jesus, it ended up in triumph on the cross when Jesus said, it is finished, and then he died. How can a death be a sign of victory? And why, are, why is the Gospel of John the only Gospel that mentions those great controversy words? Any idea? John was the latest Gospel written. Yeah. Jerusalem had been destroyed and um, <coughs> he didn't fear from the Sadducees and, and Pharisees anymore. They were gone. John was certainly right there at the cross. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus asked him to take care of take care of Mary, so mm, I don't know how many people did hear those words. How many heard those words? Yeah, was uh, was uh, it not did a, have to be kind of close to the cross to hear that, or probably, or was everyone around? Well, it? I think uh, the people who were in the immediate vicinity, I'm sure, heard the words. Mm -hmm. God wanted it to be heard. So, was Mark there? No. Matthew? No. Well, Luke wasn't there, was he? No. Well, no wonder. John is the only one that records it. <laughs> well, but they... <laughs> These people didn't write from just their own personal knowledge. There, there were stories. There were... People knew what had happened. John told his story mm -hmm. before he wrote it down. One of the most amazing passages in the, in the Gospels, in my mind, is this one in, in Luke 18, starting with verse 31. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside. Now, they're, this is the time they're walking up that narrow path where this is where the story of the Good Samaritan happened. Up that narrow road from Jericho to Jerusalem. He took his twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, are there any really difficult words there? 
<laughs> plain no. enough. It's plain enough. The hardest one is mock. Yes. Well, I don't know. You know, he talked a lot in parables, so maybe this is another one. <laughs> Doesn't sound much like a parable to me. You don't hear the disciples going, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, look at verse 34. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them. And they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Now, when it says was hidden, does that mean it's a deliberate act or they just haven't figured it out? It's hidden because they haven't figured it out. Ellen White helps us with that a little bit. In Desire of Ages, page 165, she said, because of their spiritual darkness, even the disciples of Jesus often failed to comprehend his lessons. But many of these lessons were made plain to them by subsequent events. When he walked no more with them, his words were a stay to their hearts. So the paradigm prevented them from understanding, yep. just as we've talked about sometimes in and of prior course, weeks. That couldn't happen to us, right? Of course not. <laughs> well, just think about it. Okay, they are sure, you know, I'm fighting with Johnny here about which one of us is going to be prime minister. Okay? And for someone to come and tell us, you know, Jesus is going to be, you know, Jesus is not only not going to chase out the Romans, he's going to be handed over to the Romans who are going to crucify him. He's going to die. I mean, what in the world are you talking about, right? The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem came to a shocking end when he stopped on the brow of the hill, overlooking the temple, and began to sob uncontrollably. The crowd slowly dispersed, and Jesus, I mean, what do you do when you're celebrating, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and hallelujah, here's our king, etc., and all of a sudden the king is weeping and wailing, just, just unbelievably, <coughs> you say, huh? What, what would you do? Well, after the crowd had, crowd had pretty much dispersed, Jesus went on into the temple, which was just a short distance away. He looked around briefly, but since it was late, he returned to Bethany to spend the night. That's Mark 11, 11 and 12. It was the sight of Jerusalem that pierced the heart of Jesus. Jerusalem that had rejected the Son of God and scorned his love, that refused to be convinced by his mighty miracles and was about to take his life. He saw what she was in her guilt of rejecting her Redeemer and what she might have been had she accepted him who alone could heal her wound. He had come to save her. How could he give her up? Desire of Ages 576. And where does that expression, how could he give her up, come from? Hosea. Hosea. Hosea chapter 4, verse 17. Hosea 11, 8. Uh, well, it's, it's yeah. yeah that also I in it, yeah. go? I can hand yeah. you over. Yeah. I'm God and not. More, like. more than one place in, in Hosea, yeah. <clears throat> is, is Jerusalem a, a metaphor for something uh, um, as well? Yeah. You want to know what it's a metaphor for? The people who live in the end of time. Our Bible study guide. You don't mean us, do you? <laughs> do, do I need to be more specific? Which, which, which of the people around this table? Not this side of the table. <laughs> okay. All of us? Our Bible study guide says all four Gospels mention the cleansing of the temple. This is one of the, one of the major events that Jesus, how he related to the people in Jerusalem. While John speaks of the first cleansing in John 2, verses 13 to 25, taking place during Jesus' visit to the temple at the Passover of A.D. 28, that was his very first Passover about six months after he had been baptized, okay? Others narrated the second cleansing at the end of Jesus' ministry, this time at the Passover of A.D. 31, and this, of course, now is on Monday of his final week. Thus, the two cleansings of the temple provided a parenthesis to the ministry of Jesus showing how much he cared for the sanctity of the temple and services and how strategically he asserted his messiah, messianic mission and authority. So, what, what, what happened in those cleansings? The priests and the merchants all bolted. Why? Nobody seemed to know. They just did. You had a stock exchange going on there. Yeah. <laughs> and and where, where, was, where was this the stock exchange going? In the outer 
court, wasn't it? Okay, and the outer court, what was that outer court supposed to be for? Teaching the Gentiles. It was supposed to be the court of the Gentiles. It was supposed to be the place where Gentiles were supposed to flock to Jerusalem to stand in that outer corner in a, a court and observe how the Jews were worshiping and learn to love God, presumably. Well, That's what was supposed to happen there. But if you're having to do all that necessary marketing, why? Well, what better place to do yeah, it? Yeah, necessary marketing. <laughs> well, people would come without sheep and kind of hard you to bring. You could buy a sheep very cheap right outside the gate. And then they'd bring it in and then they'd say it wasn't good enough. You got to buy this one. They'd recycle that one that they just took away from the penitent and uh, sell them the one that they, uh, that they took away to the next guy. It was a real corrupt the markup, system. The markup was about 15 to 20 times. When you walked through that gate, <clears throat> the markup was 15 to 20 times. Well, all those taxes. And a river of blood flowed down into the Kidron they, Valley. They had to pay their tax every year. Every male had to pay his tax every year, whether or not they came to Jerusalem. They have a similar system now <laughs> at, at, at the synagogues in, 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 uh, around these parts. Yeah. You have a, a, a tax that you've got to pay to the local synagogue. But there's a You're very... A very interesting statement by Ellen White in page, the Tsar of Ages, page 591 and 592, that many people seem to have overlooked. Now, I'm going to read it for you now. Three, to, three years before, and that was, now she's talking about the first cleansing of the temple, the rulers of the temple had been ashamed of their flight before the command of Jesus. They had since wondered at their own fears and their unquestioning obedience to a single humble man. I mean, why did we run? They had felt that it was impossible for their undignified... <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to chuckle when I read this. They, they had felt it was impossible for their undignified surrender to be repeated. Yet they were now, at the second cleansing of the temple, <laughs> more terrified than before, and in greater haste to obey his command. There were none who dared question his authority. Priests and traitors fled from his presence, driving their cattle before them. But my understanding, the children were not afraid no. of him. It goes right on immediately. The what, people. What demeanor? What? How did he present himself to the adults that they knew they had best? Alan White try. says just a couple, two or three words. His divinity flashed through his humanity. Now, I don't know exactly how, what that looked like, but I know it impacted people very differently. The children were singing hosannas, and the the sick were there waiting to be healed. And the stock market was <laughs> gone. Children tend to see the sincerity. They don't see the facades that we have, whereas yeah. the adults were having their own thoughts. Yeah. But he loved children. It says that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. He loved children. And kids, can, you're right. They size you up in an instant. So what, one of the questions is, you know, he, only, he planned to spend the rest of that day and the next day, and he left the temple never to come back. And basically, on Friday, the curtain was ripped from top to bottom. It was never considered to be God's center of worship ever again, although the disciples kept on using it as a place to gather. Why did he bother? And why clean up a place that's just about to be abandoned? Ever wondered about that? Was it symbolic? Yeah, in a sense, yes. Anybody else? Well, well, it's just because it was the right thing to do. I see. Okay. Well, he told a parable. Well, go ahead. <clears throat> One more chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it is true, if you read Acts 6, verse 7, and 15, Acts 15, verse 5, that a lot of the priests and Pharisees later became Christians. So they were getting the message, even though they might not have been willing to admit it at that point. One of the things that Jesus did in those last two days in the temple, yes. So, so they were converted just like the disciples, but didn't know it until a long time later. Weren't, weren't willing to admit it. Maybe it would be more accurate to say that. This is the disciples until after the resurrection, and actually until the Holy Spirit came quite some time later, mm -hmm. they didn't understand things. Well, what, one of the things he did while he was there was told the, the, the parable of the vineyard. 
Remember, the man owns this vineyard, and so he's getting ready to go away, and so he leaves some people in charge of the vineyard, and what happens? Well, they're, they're abusive to everyone he sends to collect his share of the harvest, right? <clears throat> putting it mildly. And they finally killed his son. And it's very interesting that Jesus told this parable clearly in the hearing of the leaders. And what did they think? They, he's, they, talk, he's talking about us. Yeah. But what can you say? He's just telling a story. You know, this is the way Jesus was. You know, told a story, and it's pretty obvious what, <laughs> what he was talking about, but you can't nail him because he just told a story. Right? Well, the Bible is a long love story of God for his people. Tragically, so often that love was rejected. As are, a people, are, are you saying that... Um that the priests who heard this knew what the what the intention was, but those who were not priests, other people of the audience, they, they didn't understand what they were. A lot of them understood it as well. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think yeah, a lot of them understood it. Everybody was getting the message of this. Yeah, most this of them, I think, were, I think they were getting it, yeah. <clears throat> but it, it would have been hard for the... For the, for the other people because they were accustomed to holding up the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I mean, these are the saints, right? Well, but at the same time, there are they zealots and other rabble-rousers. There are, there are people that have some of this, mm -hmm. this spotted. They just, they just don't understand. Sometimes. Yes. So which, so what did these different servants and the son represent in this parable represent? Well, I think we can be very clear on uh, who the son was. <clears throat> the, parable, the, the, the vineyard owner was God, and the son, of course, was Jesus. And the people who had come earlier, they were the prophets, that from right through the Old Testament all the way up and down through the New Testament. I think, I think it's pretty clear that's what he intended to mean. I think Stephen strongly suggested that, didn't yeah, he? Absolutely. In his speech in, in as he speech was being, in Acts 6, yeah. He was being killed. And the people who who killed the son, that would be, that would be who? Is it just the Jewish leaders? Is that the whole, is that everybody that stood around the cross and just watched it go by and did nothing to stop it? Is, is those, are we talking and about, we're talking about, about humanity every, here, all of humanity? about every sinner. Oh, well, I don't like that part. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stick well, with the in, Jews. <laughs> yeah. In, in what sense is it every sinner? <clears throat> because we all participate in sin. Now, I used to think that in light of what the verses in the Bible said, that somehow God scoops all the sins of all of us up into some kind of a big dump truck, and then he sort of dumps it on Jesus. And that's not what actually happened. Um, Jesus is showing us through his life and especially his death the results of sin doesn't matter whose sin it is, it's sin, That's period. It's a teaching process. Well, it's a teaching process, teaching. yeah. So now, we who live at this end of the world's history, do we, uh, do we have a lot of evidence before us? Do we need any instruction? Do we... Would, would we would we be like? Uh, is there any is there any possibility that we could be like the uh, those um, people who took care of the vineyard? What are you intimating here? <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is we have not only the Old Testament that they had, but we have all the New Testament, and we have all the writings of Ellen White. Yeah. And the and the. And the teachings of some other people who uh, may be quite uh, informative. Mm -hmm. So, in that story, Gordon, where are we? I don't know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping that I'm more on the prophet side. Than the <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been reading Jeremiah, mm -hmm. and that poor man. Oh boy! Oh man! I mean, he tried so hard, yeah. and the people just kept saying, "But when we worship these other gods, 
We do. They better. don't want to look back and go, yeah, but before that, and look at Jerusalem now. I mean, we choose to believe what we want to believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that Jesus did while he was there, of course, and and he kept he kept defeating. You know, they would they would come up with these these parables or the, the, these questions that they thought no matter which way Jesus answers the question, we've got him. We'll trap him. He'll be against the Romans, he'll be against the Jewish leaders, he'll be against Moses, he'll be something. They kept coming up with, and every time Jesus would give the obvious answer and they were sort of, you know, just blown away by his answers, you know, and they, they, they I mean, basically they looked foolish. So finally they said, we're going to get some people who don't even look like Pharisees, they don't look like Sadducees, they don't look like people who Jesus couldn't possibly recognize. And we're going to send, their in, send them in there and they're going to ask about, should we pay taxes to the Romans? I mean, think about a loaded question. <clears throat> you mean these were plants? Of course. Yeah. Teacher, we know that you're sent from God, and we know that you pay no attention to what anyone else says. You tell us the truth, so now tell us. I mean, you, see, you can just see the sort of sound of their voice and etc. And what did Jesus say? Get me a coin. Give me a coin. Pay unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and pay unto God that which is God's. I mean, the, the, the thing about Jesus' answers is they're so obviously logical, there's, no, there's nothing else to say. He just, you know, in a couple of sentences, he just lays it out. So what about us today? I mean, uh, tax season is around about this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right today. Do we have any problem with paying taxes? Well, well, when, when we, and basically Jesus is saying when we live under the protection and care and benefits of an earthly government, we owe that government our allegiance, so long as it's not in conflict with what? Our allegiance to God. And Ellen White comments this way about that story, Christ's reply was no evasion, but a candid answer to the question. Holding out in his hand the Roman coin upon which were stamped the name and image of Caesar, he declared that since they were living under the protection of the Roman power, they should render that power the support it claimed, so long as this did not conflict with the higher duty. But while peaceably subject to the laws of the land, they should at all times give their first allegiance to God. Desire Pages, page 602. So, is that, will there ever be a time when those of us living in a comfortable, peaceful nation like the United States have to worry about that conflict? Well, there there is a prophetic time toward the end of uh, time, but you know sometimes you face some people face those things uh, even even now. You know what's amazing? If you look, and and I'll be very interested to see what happens because I'm I've been asked to go and help out in one of the booths at the general conference session in San Antonio. What's very interesting is. If you look at the history of the Christian church down through the generations and the Adventist church in more recent times, it grows most rapidly when it's under persecution. Why is that? Makes you think of things. What did Fox call that? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the message is quite in contrast to the message that, or the religions that, that they're living under mm -hmm. uh, that they don't subscribe to, this is more reasonable, more logical. And so, otherwise, if, if it wasn't truth, they, they would not stick up for it, I don't think. A spotlight is focused on whatever situation is prevailing at the time, and so <clears throat> you can't help but but see what's going on and see the uh, the conflict between the right and the wrong. Mm -hmm. At time of persecution, the <clears throat> truth comes out more clearly mm -hmm. and more succinctly. Mm -hmm. 
In Revelation 13 and 14, we read about a final conflict which spills over in Revelation 15 and 16. We're not talking about that right now. But Ellen White spells that out. She says there will come a national Sunday law and an international Sunday law. And Revelation 13 tells us the devil is going to do everything he possibly can to make it impossible for people who don't follow his plan for them to buy and sell. He, he, he's, going to try to, he's going to try to starve us out. And I had a, an email just this week asking a question. And I'll put this question to you. Could the Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization, now, as a legal organization, could it continue to exist and uphold all the things we believe in at that point in time? Financially, I don't think so. Financially? I mean, you only got to watch the paper every day. They're nibbling away already. At, at our this, rights. Uh, huh? at, at rights, and, and average people don't seem to realize it, but they're talking about they need maybe we need to get back to church on Sundays mm -hmm. and uh, well you know the about government the government is getting more and more involved and watching every one of us whether we believe it or not one way or another it could happen overnight we're yeah. told the last movements are going to be rapid there's a woman senator from the state of Colorado who said we are losing our moral direction in this country we should require by law everybody to attend church on Sunday Okay. Well, Muslims are not going to appreciate that too much. We'll see how that all plays out. Neither will the Seventh-day Adventists. No. Or the Seventh-day Baptists. But what I was suggesting to you is that a church that has as its one of its principal teachings that we have to worship God on Saturday, the Sabbath, will not be legally possible, legal, legally tenable, when an international, or uh, even a national Sunday law is passed. I mean, how could that, how, how could those, I mean, I don't see how those two things could coexist. That such a church, if it survived, would have to compromise its principles. Mm -hmm. And then it would, but when well, you see it, would, how much, it would compromise. How much federal money comes into our medical institutions, that could dry up overnight. Yeah. Would just take them over. Yeah. That too. Yeah. But, well, geez. let's come down to that that last supper we call it the final meal what 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 did they do at the final meal what were the jews supposed to do do you remember what happens at passover supposed to have lamb, roasted lamb and roasted herbs. lamb and bitter herbs yeah. you think the disciples and jesus did that well if they were they were participating in the uh, in the service in the sure they would. Okay. And if it was something that happened on an annual basis, they'd <clears throat> they'd grown up doing it. Yeah. <coughs> so why don't we? Why isn't that mentioned at all in Scripture? You mean the food? Yeah, at, at the last well, supper. Just assumed. It's just assumed. But it does I mean, talk it about. There's it does talk We're about celebrating the, this Passover, so that's what people do. So okay. don't need to detail every little thing. I see. But we do detail the grape juice and the unleavened bread. Well, that was something new. Well, that was something, something new. Different. Okay. So what's that, a, what's yeah, the difference? You have to talk uh, about. What, what's the contrast? What kind of contrasts are there between the Passover and this now what we sometimes call the, you know, or well, choose whatever we are, the Lord's Supper, whatever you choose to call it. Well, the, the message is the same. The symbols are changed. Okay, what's different? What's different? Mm -hmm. Well, instead of the lamb and the bitter herbs, we're drinking grape juice and having bread. Okay. Instead yeah. of looking back to the Exodus, we're looking forward to what we're looking, yeah. yeah. So this Jesus is death. probably the main difference. Jesus is saying, we've looked back long enough. It's time to look forward. Well, um, maybe I need to stand to be corrected here, but it was my understanding that even though the Passover occurred and, and, and had a, a, a memory component to it about <clears throat> that night in Egypt, nevertheless, the Lamb represented well, the Messiah to come. Yeah. And 
<coughs> but I'm sure they didn't. I mean, and, and I, I want to be respectful as I say this. As they were participating in the partaking of the roasted lamb with their clothes packed, ready to go out of Egypt, they weren't thinking about a Messiah who's coming, you know, 1,500 years from now. Well, but I think, I, I think many people may be overlooking some of the significance, similar significances when they participate in the. Not arguing with that with you about that at all. Yeah, it seems to me like there has been a ritual from the outset. Mm -hmm. um, um, the minute Adam and Eve uh, mm -hmm. uh, digressed, God instituted this this sacrificial system, mm -hmm. and it has changed through the years. But the message is always the same: mm -hmm. is that um, there is a Messiah. Um, and God is reaching out to us. Right. And, and it seems to me that, that when we celebrate the, the communion as we celebrate it today in the Christian church, that's a replacement for the old symbols of the, all that sacrificial system. This, this would be my understanding of what Christians, certainly I don't think Jewish people would agree with this, but it would be the Christian approach that, that uh, we don't do those those sacrifices anymore. We don't go to the temple. We don't have this temple. We have this is the ritual that we now use. Yeah. Okay. Is this correct or? Yeah, basically. <coughs> yeah, I, mean, I think there's many, I mean, you've probably heard many sermons on this. I mean, there's lots of innuendos. There's lots of implications of all that, but yeah. Um, why, why the change? Why, why the change in, in symbology? Previously, they had little altars, and it just grew bigger and bigger and bigger into this big yeah. system, which there seems to be some indication that this was under God's direction. Mm -hmm. So now why this? Why this well, I little... see several things. One, <clears throat> the Jews regarded the Passover as their distinctive thing. So now when Jesus has established a Christian church, he says it's not just Jewish, it's for everybody. And so we're moving away from the st distinctly Jewish symbols to something more, more easily available to everybody. But was the early sacrificial system and no. the temples, was that, that wasn't just meant for No, no. Jews. I, I agree with you. Our Bible study guide says something very interesting. It says, the death of Jesus was God's sole means for our redemption from sin. What, what would you say that means? What, what, what were they trying to tell us? Would you repeat that? The death of Jesus was God's, and I'm quoting their words, God's sole means for our redemption from sin. Now let me just make some suggestions. You can reject these or throw them out, whatever you want. One possibility is that Jesus somehow is paying for our sins. Is, Who is, was the payment to? Yeah. It's, well, the implication of, of that statement of the Bible study guide is paying to somebody, mm -hmm. but I don't subscribe to that point mm -hmm. of view. Well, so what, what, what else could it mean? Is there some really important things? I mean, here's the question. Is this some kind of a legal transaction or a kind of a, even a financial transaction that takes place that's way beyond our comprehension? It, Maybe it happened behind a cloud somewhere in heaven and everybody was happy. We just said, okay, God took care of it. Thank you, Lord. Or is his death supposed to very specifically teach us something? Remember we talked about back in the beginning that his death is supposed to turn us into friends. How does his death turn us into friends? We well, have to, uh, The RSV says it was to reconcile us. Yeah. But really... For generations, mankind was not in a state of conciliation. You can't reconcile something that was not in a state of conciliation yeah. at some time in the past. What he did was to bring mankind and himself into a state of conciliation. Yeah. Well, the life and death of Jesus answered the most important questions that Satan had raised in the Great Controversy. I think that is a really significant statement, in my opinion. Those questions had to be answered before we could be sure, beyond the slightest shadow of a doubt, that one, 
all of Satan's accusations against God are completely false. Who's telling us the truth now? Not Satan. God. And two, God himself can be, can be completely trusted. Now, would that turn us into friends? I think so. Should do. I mean, don't, don't, you, don't you prefer to be friends with people you can trust? Absolutely. There are two important lessons we need to recognize from the Lord's Supper. Christ died for every one of us. As a community, as we partake of the grape juice and the unleavened bread, we are sharing Christ's body, recognizing the equality that exists among us. So all of us are partaking of that same symbol. And we're, we're, we're saying we're a family. Well, that statement by the Bible study guide, Jesus never said that. No. It's, it's purely a conclusion uh, on, based upon certain ways of looking at things with a yeah. certain set of theological spectacles yeah. that was not from Jesus. Yeah. And you, don't, you get to Romans, they messed up a very important verse uh, mm -hmm. we, that we're familiar with in Romans 3, 25 and 6. Jesus' death was to demonstrate that God is righteous. Another way of, of putting that that's very commonly stated is, how did or does Jesus' body and blood purchase our salvation? It doesn't. If it's economic, <laughs> it purchase. He didn't have any money left. He was stripped naked, hanging from a cross, intended, the Romans intended to make him as, as abused and as you know, look as a treason to the Roman government, to look as absolutely forbidden and forsaken as you can possibly be. That was, so he wasn't in a position to pay anything financially, that's for sure. Well, I would like to suggest that sooner or later, every human being will discover that there on the cross, Jesus died the second death as a direct result of sin. He didn't die of crucifixion, blood loss, pain, or having been severely beaten, his death was an example of how the wicked will die in the end. And of course, many of you will recognize that Ellen White says that very specifically. As we look at that awful death, do we want to experience it ourselves? Do we want to die the death of the wicked? Or do we want to accept his offer of salvation and eternal life in heaven and in the new earth? At the cross, do we see Jesus burning and never burning hell? So if we say Jesus died the death of the wicked, what's the death of the wicked? Well, most of our Christian friends would say it's what? An ever burning hell. So did Jesus die, is Jesus burning somewhere in an ever burning hell? Of course not. Or did he die just of separation from God? Yes. And if you will allow me, I will read from Desire of Ages, page 389, paragraph 3. To eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive Him as our personal Savior, believing that He forgives our sins and that we are complete in Him. It is by beholding His love, by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in, that we are to become partakers of His nature. What food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes a part of our being. So Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal savior. A theoretical knowledge will do us no good. We must feed upon him, receive him into the heart, so that his life becomes our life. His love, his grace must be assimilated. Evolutionists and atheists have stated repeatedly that everything that has happened in the history of our world is merely a result of physical processes. They have said that there is no ultimate meaning to anything, that that might make you feel depressed. And how should you respond if you feel depressed? Well, one famous uh, evolutionist said, we have medicines for that. Aren't you glad that we have Prozac? Well, why do you need Jesus if you have Prozac, right? Aren't you glad that all Christians do not have to depend on medications for their happiness? Jesus said repeatedly that if we follow him, we will be blessed or happy. When Jesus agreed to participate in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, wasn't he just feeding the false hopes of the Jewish people, including his disciples? 
That didn't sound like that. So why did he why did he participate in that entry into Jerusalem? To focus well, attention. It was a it was a real act just because they misinterpreted it. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was their king. He was coming to Jerusalem, but there's a very specific reason why he did it. He wanted to make sure that everyone in Jerusalem would be talking about him. And remember what the men on the road to Emmaus said? Are you the only, only one in Jerusalem that isn't talking about what's happened there this last week? He wanted to make sure that, that there's no way that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees could get rid of Jesus secretly and nobody, without anybody noticing. And it was also a sign of the Messiah to come. Yeah. Well, I love this statement by Ellen mm -hmm. White. This one is in Desire of Ages, page 7, 775, paragraph 1. Many minds were busy with thoughts starting by the, started by the scenes of Calvary. From the crucifixion to the resurrection, many sleepless eyes were constantly searching the prophecies, some to learn the full meaning of the feast they were then celebrating, some to find evidence that Jesus was not what he claimed to be, and others with sorrowful hearts were searching for proofs that he was the true Messiah. Though searching with different objects in view, all were convicted of the same truth. The prophecy had been fulfilled in the events of the past few days, and that the crucified one was the world's redeemer. Many who at that time united in the service never again took part in the Paschal Rites. Many, even of the priests, were convicted of the true character of Jesus. Their searching of the prophecies had not been in vain, and after his resurrection they acknowledged him as the Son of God. When Jesus went to the ancient Jewish capital in Jerusalem, we know what happened. Would Jesus come to the Seventh-day Adventist church in our generation? If he came to your church or even your home today, how would he be received? If you have some of these questions and you've struggled with them yourselves, we have a suggestion. Our handouts that we've been following, we use in our discussion here, are available online at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Get them and look at them and struggle with the questions yourself and see what answers you have and what answers your church can give to these absolutely essential questions in the Great Controversy. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to discuss these most important events in the history of our world. Forgive us where we may have overlooked some important issues. Help us to understand the details that give it more meaning. And may we come to be more like you as we do as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.